The novel takes place in many different time periods, all of which are undergoing disinvestment and the industrialization, where people have to struggle to create their own infrastructures of public support. And the dirigible in the book represents people's struggle and aspiration to do it themselves uh, after being exploited and abandoned by larger government entities. People in the early 20th century actually did have aspirations that air travel would ameliorate or correct social issues and social problems. This is Seshu Foster, he's my collaborator on uh, Elada, the main writer of the novel, um, and longtime collaborator. He's a retired teacher, uh, LAUSD, member of UTLA. This is uh, Arturo Romo. We've been collaborating for at least a decade, starting with his performances and exhibitions. We've been thinking about and working on these text and visual collaborations for years. Finally, they are out in the novel El Adat, History of the East Los Angeles Dirigible Air Transport Lines. When I was in college, I was away from Los Angeles and City Terrace Field Manual, which Seshu had gifted to me, was a really important text to carry with me. And being away from LA, I was able to delve into that living history of LA through the book. And so I would send Seshu drawings. He would then send me poems back that were based on the drawings. You know, our collaboration has always been about place. It's always been about where we find ourselves, our location in history, our location in space. We produced the website called the ELA Guide, the East LA Guide, with the aim to commemorate and reveal some of the hidden history, the whitewashed or denied histories. And that's part of a central part of our project, making visible the lives and history of, of people on the east side. Disruption and disappearance is a feature of how we live um, and whether it's acknowledged or not. And so because it's a feature, a baseline feature of living on this land, as an artist, I'm just trying to be in that place, like truly to be in that place while I'm producing work. And that means that when things interrupt my process, that those get folded into the process. Same thing with the book. We had to fight against an impulse to clarify, clean it up, and make it seamless, but narratives don't really work that way if you're on a land like this with a history like this, um, because it's full of interruptions, it's full of disappearances. Disruptions tend to structure the book. There's a disjointedness to a bunch of the chapters, partly because they describe, you know, failure and the folly of, of the, the characters. The characters don't have a continuously unfolding succession of success, because that's not the way the world works. <laughs> this kind of outlines some of the process behind uh, what me and Sesha were working on to prepare for the book and then the creation of the story for the book. Some of this is archival material. You know, we conducted interviews and also looked in the in archives of some Chicano newspapers. Newspapers put out by Mecha, um, a really important periodical called Regeneración, which actually started with the Flores Magón brothers, revolutionary anarchists out of Mexico who were stationed up here in exile. To me, it, it showed that the issues that we're talking about today in terms of like oppression, brutality, police brutality, are kind of continuous issues. The newspapers and periodicals also tell us that like, struggle against those forms of oppression is also continuous. Some of these are fictionalized. So these are, some of this work right here is satires or takes on some of the work that we found up here. You have actual articles from historical documents and you have kind of fake articles that are purporting to be from an era, but are really not. The book isn't 
just about the future, or it's not about a vision of the future that erases the past. It's a vision of a future that actually incorporates the past as a continuous practice. Dirigibles are an obvious failure of the 20th century. Initial aspirations for dirigibles and zeppelins were that they were going to help unite the world, that this kind of lighter than air travel would shorten the distances between countries, shorten the distances between cultures and people, and, and serve to make the world a better and more peaceful place. I guess the dirigible in the book is like a metaphor for social struggle and social uplift. And, um, but it also dovetails and weaves in and out of actual histories of people who have tried to do these things, have tried to see uh, new technologies as places and to start at the ground level and build industries that can uplift all people instead of those pre-existing industries that were built to exclude certain types of people. I am just as colonized by Hollywood in my imagination as anybody. I mean, I grew up with John Wayne killing Indians and, and the whole cowboy culture. And now I'm trying to write something that is counter to that, counter to the idea that every culture that the U.S. projects its guilt upon is the enemy of the civilization, but instead deal with uh, the issues here at home, the issues that, that people actually have to live through in their ordinary, in their daily lives. Mm -hmm replacing this type of linear, uninterrupted, future forward colonizer narrative uh, with another type of narrative that more closely matches lived experience of people. That required a whole bunch of tricks, right? Like yeah. interruptions in dialogue, uh, not treating people who are dead as like gone, but uh, treating them as still accessible and still present in our lives. A counter process to creating a better counter narrative that isn't so like linear. Evergreen Cemetery and this is the oldest cemetery in Los Angeles and one of the interesting things about it is that it is not a segregated cemetery. This cemetery has a mix of people that represent the dead of the 20th century including James Banning. He died at age 32. James Banning was the first commercially licensed African-American pilot in the United States. He was the first African-American to fly from the East Coast to the West Coast. Starting in 1929, he came to Los Angeles and he worked with William Powell on the Bessie Coleman Aero Club, which promoted pre-pilot training for African-American men and women. They were dreaming that dream of advancement and progress for the quote-unquote race. That idea of progress and advancement is a narrative. It's a narrative that, that everybody dreams at some point. People uh, are often not conscious of their dreaming, but that is part of the narrative in the book. The narrative in the book has these overlapping uh, and sometimes conflicting narratives that are dreams and counter dreams. They are expectations that may not come to fruition, but they are also aspirations that definitely might come to fruition. The fiction is that we all survive by ourselves or that an artist just creates by themselves. Like that's all just some fiction that doesn't actually yeah, I think, I think that's the narrative that Eladat counters individuals succeeding on their own alone. Our narrative proposes that only in community with a kind of collectivity do, do people really succeed. I don't think you would feel successful if you were alive and your community was destroyed. It's only with that kind of collective part of ourselves that we can advance or progress or move forward or have a better world, better life. When I hear that question, what is utopia, I'm thinking more as an artist and educator, like what do I have to say about a utopian project? And it makes me think about like the way that we create as artists 
and what our place in social movements is really. There's a project of decolonization and reclamation of space that I think artists have a role in. And then that informs our process in terms of what we write about, what we create about, the stories that we tell. Rethinking the, the questions that we're asking as artists so that we can be part of a liberatory movement or, or liberatory process. Mm -hmm.